Hi Bio 111 students and welcome to uh, part 2 of the chapter 3 lecture. Um, we're going to start talking about uh, one of the lipid molecules, uh, triglyceride. Um, but first of all I want you to show I want to show you um, the different components of triglyceride. Uh, first of all we have a glycerol. A glycerol um, and all generally denote, denotes that there is it's it's a form of um, an alcohol actually so um, it's got an OH group at the end of each carbon and um, that gives it the all and we have uh, three carbons the hydroxide group on one side and uh, the hydrogen bonds covering the rest of the area um, on this side we see three fatty acids and they are saturated fatty acids because we see no double carbon no double bonds between carbons a double bond between a carbon would make this an unsaturated fatty acid and we don't see those here uh, but we do see a carboxyl group on one side and carboxyl groups and hydrogen groups or uh, hydroxide groups are attracted to each other and uh, you'll see in a moment why um, this should be something familiar to you it's called the dehydration synthesis so what happens is water leaves and we end up with a bond formed between this oxygen and the first carbon this is now called a triglyceride uh, what you might notice is unusual about it is you hear the word triglyceride, you might think there's three glycerols, but actually they're not. Um, there's three fatty acids and one glycerol. So, let's have a look at this uh, saturated uh, fatty acid. We'll take everything off the board except it. So the glycerol is going away. And uh, we'll stick the OH back on. And as you can see, it doesn't matter what order you put HO or OH. So, because we see lots of hydrogens on here, uh, we call this a saturated fatty acid. Um, no double bonds and hydrogen can just saturate the entire molecule as much as it wants to. Um, so every carbon needs to have four bonds and we see one, two, three, four with this carbon, one, two, three, four with that one. And everywhere where there's an available bond, there's carbon in there. Uh, now what would happen if a double bond was to form? Well, first thing that would happen, the double bond would form and now these two carbons uh, have more than four bonds so hydrogen will be kicked off and that will cause um, a phenomenon called bending or kicking or um, kinking This is now called an unsaturated fatty acid because there's not uh, hydrogens everywhere um, and also we have a double bond between two carbons. So that is the definition of an unsaturated fatty acid. So, unsaturated fatty acids, or saturated fatty acids, uh, have no double bonds, and uh, they have four hydrogen bonds, uh, or four, four bonds on every carbon, um, and uh, 
at least two of them will be hydrogen. Um, they are generally solid at room temperature. They contain butter, lard, you might have heard something that was used for cooking in the old days called suet. And one thing that all of these fats have in common is they are all of animal origin. So they are all animal fats. Now, they're not all bad, but uh, in terms of cholesterol, and triglycerides and uh, some of the other fats that we find in animal fats, not that good. Um, but the thing to remember is they're solid at room temperature and um, uh, that's how you know it's a saturated fat and they are the ones without dull bonds between carbons. So let's talk about unsaturated. Olive oil, vegetable oil, and just, we'll say peanut oil. We could say sesame oil, oil, or there's many different oils we could talk about, but we'll go with these three for now. One thing about all of these is they are liquid at room temperature. So they're liquid at room temperature, and if you'll notice one thing they also have in common, they are all of vegetable origin. Uh, so they are plant origin oils. And plant origin oils generally are considered better for us. Um, unlike the animal oils that contain bad cholesterol in higher n amounts, these contain some of the good fats and good cholesterols um, for, uh, that look better on our blood count. So, uh, another fat that we want to talk about today is even worse than the worst of the animal fats and that is called trans fat. Technology can be a wonderful thing, but in this case, uh, not so much. Uh, these are artificially engineered. To be liquid. at room temperature. And how they do that is basically they force hydrogen um, in a process called hydrogenation. And that's why you'll see the terms hydrogenated fat, partially hydrogenated fat, uh, used to describe these trans fats. Um, they are uh, found in margarine. And ironically, it was once thought that uh, we should stop eating butter and uh, everybody for a while switched to margarine thinking that that was healthier for us. And then the doctors started noticing the bad cholesterol numbers were uh, increasing rather than decreasing. And uh, the reason for that was because uh, trans fat uh, are more readily uptake, there's more readily uptaken by the body. And um, as a result, um, uh, they get into the bloodstream even quicker with uh, bad cholesterol. So they will raise your bad cholesterol numbers. Um, Fats are not all bad. Some fats are very beneficial for us, and among those is omega-3s. Uh, so 
So, omega-3 fatty acids, uh, you can read about them in your book and you'll see that the name omega-3 uh, refers to the position uh, that we uh, find on the fatty acid, the part of the fatty acid that um, we find uh, something special going on. We don't need to go into that in the lecture. But um, they are polyunsaturated fats. Polyunsaturated, lots of uh, double bonds, and um, they um, are uh, quite good for us. We find um, uh, sources of these are some of the fish species. So we find it in salmon, trout, and tuna, and uh, some of the um, plant sources for these omega trees are walnuts and uh, flaxseed. So uh, now just we'll just uh, finish up uh, lipids by talking about some of the functions of lipids um, uh, that we haven't covered yet. So we talked about triglycerides. They are found in your bloodstream. And their primary function is energy storage. And they are very efficient at energy storage. And in fact, um, when you take a, a kilogram of triglycerides, or, or 100 grams of triglycerides versus um, 100 grams of carbohydrates, we will find twice the energy storage. Of that of carbohydrates. Um, now we're going to talk about phospholipids. These are, these are the cell membrane lipids. They are um, found in the cell membranes of all of the cells of living things. And they basically look like this. They have a polar head that has phosphate in it. And attached to that polar head, they have two fatty acids. And one of these fatty acids has a kink. And that tells you that that's the location of a double bond between two carbons. So that is your unsaturated fatty acid. And this one is your saturated fatty acid. And uh, what happens is you end up with layers like this with all their tails pointing on this way. And on the inside is the inside, the inner membrane. And the reason why they orient themselves like this is because these parts here are hydrophobic or hydrophilic so they will orient towards the water. And these parts here, fatty acids, as their lipids, are hydrophobic. Uh, they do not like water at all. So that's why they end up orienting themselves in this way, because they orient themselves towards the water, extracellular fluid, and towards the water, the intracellular fluid. And uh, the tails, which are made up of fatty acids, they're hydrophobic, so they will orient themselves away from water. Uh, another lipid we want to talk about are steroids.
and steroids consist of four fused rings of carbon. Um, so we will always see that four ring structure and that lets you know that it's a steroid we're talking about and um, uh, cholesterol and cortisol are two examples of steroids all of the steroids end up in this ending like cortisol and cholesterol and uh, um, I know these two have uh, a bad name in general uh, well cholesterol in particular, but uh, they are necessary for uh, cell membrane health. So the last thing to talk about with uh, lipid functions are all of the waxes. And oils. Example of a wax would be uh, you go to the uh, any leaf uh, on a tree. You take um, you take it off the tree and have a look at it, or look at it while it's on the tree, even better. And you'll see a shiny layer on the roof, on on the on the top side of the leaf, and that is because there are natural waxes covering this leaf um, mainly for waterproofing and uh, uh, it also protects the plant against uh, losing its moisture which uh, you know somewhere in Chicago and, uh, or, or in the desert anywhere it is uh, it's very important to conserve water also um, we also see this uh, waterproofing as a need uh, in animals so like ourselves and uh, uh, more famously we'll see it in otters and in aquatic birds because they produce a lot more but it's oils in animals for waterproofing and again it keeps water in as well as letting water out or uh, keeping water in as well as keeping water out. So now we're going to get into proteins. And we can talk about proteins which are the building blocks of um, all, all things. Um, we can't talk about them without talking about their building blocks which are amino acids. Proteins are actually long chains of amino acids, but let's have a look at one individual amino acid first. So we have a central carbon, and that's attached to an amino group on one side. An amino group is an NH2, if you remember from your study notes. and. Um, on the other side, we have our carboxyl group. The carboxyl group, if you remember, is a carbon attached to a hydroxyl, but it's also attached to an oxygen. So we say carb ox -il. So, um, all amino acids look like this, but they all have different names. And the reason why they have different names is because they are attached to other things uh, called OR groups. And that's a different molecule, uh, usually a chain of carbons 
oxygens and whatever, but um, amino acids are named for their or groups. Otherwise, they would just be called amino acids and there would be no need to differentiate between them. So, uh, let's talk about what happens when a couple of amino acids come close to each other. So we have here And it's going to be attached to its own R group. And what we end up with here is, uh, again, something you've heard of, dehydration synthesis occurs. So this water leaves. And what we end up with is known as a peptide bond. So, between the nitrogen on one side from the amino group, we end up with this bond with the carboxyl carbon from the other, uh, the other amino acid. Uh, this is called a peptide bond. And because this is no longer a single amino acid, it is now a protein. So, uh, proteins can consist of a, a lot of amino acids. Um, so, uh, when amino acids join together, they form proteins. So, uh, as we talked about, it's a chain of amino acids, and um, uh, in every cell in our body, we have thousands of proteins, and they all have different jobs to do. So, um, some of the functions of proteins are digestive enzymes, These are the um, substances with the ASE in their name at the end, and they catabolize food substances. Um, they transport nutrients and uh, uh, whatever we need uh, around our body. Um, there are structural protons, proteins, and structural proteins are uh, found in the cytoskeleton and in other structural elements. The cytoskeleton is uh, 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 the area of the cell uh, that keeps shape. Um, hormones. They're the structural, they are, are the chemical messengers of our body. So if something was needed in one area or the other, a hormone would be sent out and then transport proteins would go and uh, get uh, whatever's needed and bring it to, bring it to the area. Um, we have defense proteins. They act against pathogens, so disease-causing uh, 
uh, uh, molecules, uh, our defense proteins are activated to deal with those. Um, we have contractile proteins. And contractile proteins are found in the muscle cells of our body. Um, we have two different types of muscle and contractile proteins are found in both. Um, we also have storage proteins. Storage proteins, um, they're found in uh, a seeds energy store. So for instance, um, uh, oatmeal, wheat, um, um, all the various seeds that we eat, they have proteins in them that are stored to help the new seedling uh, grow. And um, of course, if we get there first, uh, we can take that protein as dietary protein for us and uh, we make it into bread or uh, we have it as cereal. And um, as a result, that's what ends up happening to the storage proteins. So, um, talking about structure, protein structure, um, all of these functions here are dependent on the protein structure. It's unique. Two function. So, um, if a protein is a digestive protein, it will have a particular uh, shape, and uh, that shape um, uh, helps it to grab onto whatever uh, foods it is uh, taking in, and it is very specialized. And that is the same of all of our proteins. They are specialized by their shape to a particular function. Now, a problem occurs when something goes wrong with that shape. And uh, that um, is known as denaturing a protein. So you might look at it this way. A protein with a function has a nature. A protein uh, a protein with a shape has a nature, something it does, a function. A uh, protein without, uh, that's been denatured, can no longer perform that function. So let's say that that protein is an enzyme that breaks down a particular um, uh, substance, it can no longer do that if it has been denatured. And how a protein gets denatured, uh, there are a few different ways, but the most common way is exposure to heat. So we think about uh, in humans, um, some of the dangerous fever temperatures, uh, 104, uh, 104 degrees Fahrenheit and higher than that, uh, we will start to see uh, denaturing of proteins. Uh, this is an irreversible process, so it can lead to death in many cases. And that is the reason why uh, very high fevers can be so dangerous. Uh, it's the body's attempt to denature the foreign proteins but it actually can end up uh, denaturing our own proteins if the temperature gets too high. And um, so uh, exposure to heat can do it. Exposure to unsuitable pH, that can be acid or base. Um, 
and uh, so um, um, that's uh, some of the things that can cause denaturing of proteins. The important thing to remember is form and function go together in proteins and that is the reason why when uh, something like heat changes the shape of a protein permanently uh, it means that uh, it can no longer perform that function. So uh, let's talk a bit about protein structures. There are several different types. So um, primary structure is the simplest and it's basically the chain of uh, polypeptides. And uh, they're the um, individual uh, amino acids. Um, so, uh, for example, uh, if we look on page 81 of the book, we will see, um, let's see what page 81. Page 81, it's a uh, figure 325. Uh, we will see um, the hormone insulin, a uh, very important ho hormone. Uh, it helps to uh, regulate um, our blood sugar and also it uh, helps us to convert blood sugar into the energy that we need. So there are two chains, A and B, in the hormone insulin and um, uh, one is shorter than the other one. So one consists of 21 amino acids while the other consists of 30 amino acids. And we'll call them chain A and B. And uh, they have disulfide bonds. So that means that there's a sulfur on either side of each chain coming out. And where they come out is where the link is going to form between the two sulfurs. So, uh, it's a unique sequence that determines the protein made. And an error in just one amino acid uh, can cause problems. And some of the problems that it can lead to are uh, something called sickle cell anemia and we'll give you a little demonstration of that. So here we have an ordinary blood cell and it's sort of uh, concave so it's like two balls uh, back to back and we've got a dip in the center like this. So you know it's a uh, you might see it, it looks sort of like this on a microscope because the outer part is uh, coming out a little more than the inside. And we'll see a disc with uh, a bowl shape to it. Um, sickle cell is when um, the protein that's made is uh, off by a few amino acids and what ends up happening is this. Those cells are not functional at all. Those red blood cells actually cannot uh, carry oxygen, which is one of the primary roles of uh, a red blood cell. And uh, they can clump together and cause um, very painful uh, blood clots in blood vessels. And uh, that is called a sickle cell event or a sickle cell attack. And um, it's one of those genetic disorders that's it's pretty horrible to have because uh, it will shorten your life 
and also um, it uh, uh, is quite painful. So the secondary structure of protein. Um, there's hydrogen bonds between the uh, oxygens and hydrogens and that causes uh, folding. Um, we'll see something like an alpha helix. So you have proteins, all different proteins along this chain and because there's a slight attraction to uh, the oxygens and the hydrogens you'll have this kind of spring-like folding taking place and that is called an alpha helix. This is considered a secondary structure of protein. So, um, there's also a tertiary structure and quaternary structure. And, uh, they're in the book, um, and basically, um, tertiary structure um, it's uh, it re refers to the proteins. Um, that are in each unique uh, third structure. And um, for quaternary structure, uh, I would see figure 330 in your book. Um, I also want to cover another secondary structure that we have, and that is called the beta pleated sheet. So, as it sounds like, it is kind of more like this. Um, with this part folding over and going in different directions. Um, again, that's not something that you're going to see uh, on our exam anyway for this, but just know that there are four different ways that um, proteins are built. And um, primary structure is the most simple and quaternary structure number four is the most complex. So now um, we're going to talk a little bit about um, uh, DNA. DNA, DNA is deoxyribonucleic acid and um, each little piece, a monomer of DNA if you will, or RNA, is a nucleotide. And it's spelled like this. So that's a monomer of DNA, so one, one um, um, single unit of what will be the polymer DNA. Um, so it consists of a nitrogenous base, which will look like this. Right away, that looks like two car two um, rings of carbon, six each. That's not correct. It's actually got some nitrogen in it, hence the word nitrogenous. And one of these is actually a five ringer. So we have nitrogens here, here, here. Here, and we have an NH2 
also here. So that's your nitrogenous base. The next part of our nucleotide is a pentose. So we see the word OSE O -S -E, and we immediately think, oh, it's sugar, and that's what it is. And pent is from the Latin uh, for five. So we have. Uh, five rings and uh, we also have a phosphate group So what we have is a phosphate group, a sugar pentose, and a nitrogenous base. So all nucleotides consist of a nitrogenous base, a pentose, and a phosphate group. And um, the two types of nucleic acids, RNA, and DNA are polynucleotides, so they have lots of these all chained together. So polynucleotides DNA is double stranded it is found mainly in the nucleus of every cell in our body and its job um, the oxyribonucleic acid its job is um, to uh, contain all genetic information that makes each of us plants, animals, fungi um, uh, whatever living thing it is makes us a unique being so the other one of the polynucleotides is RNA and that is not the oxyribonucleic acid, it is just ribonucleic acid. And uh, it's part of cell reproduction because basically what you've got is a single strand with nucleotides and so nucleotides we have adenine Guanine, thymine, and cytosine are the um, ones found in DNA. Adamine, uracil, guanine, and cytosine are found in RNA. So the difference is that uracil is found in RNA, not DNA, and thymine is the one that it's substituted for. So thymine is only found in DNA. So this single structure, let's say it's A, uh, U G C helps to code when it meets up with a random set of nucleotides that are not connected yet it helps line them up and it makes new strands and so for every A you get a U or a T for every U you get um, an A for every G you get a C and for every G you get a C or C you get a G and so now you've got this new strand so mRNA acts like this and mRNA is the way that uh, they're making the new vaccine 
the way they're making the new vaccine is they're sending in a messenger RNA or mRNA that is uh, telling our body produce more of this and that this is uh, antibodies to the virus and that's how mRNA is working to uh, revolutionize uh, vaccine production because this is the first time that mRNA was used in vaccine production we're not using uh, dead virus cells or denatured virus cells well not really virus cells because they're not cells but virus particles we're not using that anymore now we are using mRNA and it's a more efficient uh, system and it helps us uh, because we can produce mRNA at a much faster rate than we can produce denatured virus that still produces an antibody response from our body. And uh, that's it. We're going to talk about cells next time.